Hello and welcome to the first episode of Faraday Tech Cafe. The aim of this podcast is to bring you interesting stories, information about new technologies, and fresh perspectives from around the development community. Make sure you subscribe so you can get notified about new episodes that come out every Monday. In this first episode, I interview Jesse Weigel, a senior software engineer at Dick's Sporting Goods, who is a prolific content creator and also live streams frequently for the Free Code Camp YouTube channel. Welcome to the show, Jesse. Great to have you on. Oh, it's great to be here. Do you want to introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. I'm Jesse Weigel. I'm a senior software engineer with uh, Dick Sporting Goods, and I also do live coding for the Free Code Camp YouTube channel. Awesome. So you said you're a senior software engineer. Can you tell us a little bit about your background leading up to that? Like, how did you first get into programming and technology? Well, I've always been interested in computers and even just electronics in general. I like taking things apart and trying to fix them when I was a kid. In high school, I I did take one class where we learned a little bit of HTML and CSS. So it was like my first programming. Uh, I took a C++ course in college, and then I didn't really do much programming for a while after that, uh, for maybe like four or five years. Uh, And then I I did a bunch of non-programming jobs, (laughs) so uh, some restaurant jobs, teaching, and uh, finally get into coding. So can I ask you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I just want to ask you real quick. Why did you take a break after college, after you took C++ and everything? So I I had a big misconception about what a programming job would be like. And I kind of thought I'd be stuck like in a cubicle. So I had the image in my mind of uh, like the scene in uh, the the movie The Matrix where Neo's at his uh, his office job and he's just in this cubicle and it just seems like it's a terrible job and he hates it. <laughs> and so I, I kind of had like that picture in my mind of that's what my life would be like, uh, which is totally not how it really is as a programmer. Um, and I also really, d- like I didn't know what I wanted to do with, with my life. I switched colleges a few times and even like took a semester off and just worked. So it kind of took me a while to even get finished with school. And by the time I finished, it was just like, I I graduated with a business degree because that was the fastest way for me to graduate. And um, uh, and just kind of took the first job that I could find. So that, that I, I just didn't really put that much thought into what I wanted to do. I just couldn't make up my mind. You're kind of figuring it out. Mm-hmm. You do sit at the computer a lot, so it is kind of like it is in the matrix so is it more fun than you envisioned yeah it's so much more fun than i than i ever thought it would be the things that i get to create it's fun like uh sometimes in the past i've set timers on my phone to remind me to quit working like when it was time to go home because i just get so into it it's cool to have a job like that like it's definitely like yes i am still sitting at a computer all day (laughs) but it's not a lonely job, right? Like I, I there's a, a community. Yeah. I mean, when I was coming up, really thinking about what I wanted to do, like Facebook had just come out, right? My my freshman year of college. So like the whole idea that you could be online all day, but then also be interacting with people all day was still kind of new. So it turns out I interacted with way more people as a programmer than I did at any of my other jobs. And I interact with them in a much more meaningful way than I did at my previous jobs. That makes sense. Yeah. So I want to move on and talk about live streaming. I know you're a prolific live streamer for the very large YouTube channel, Free Code Camp. What made you start live streaming? Yeah, so I, uh, I did not set out to have a large audience. <laughs> My goal was just to share. I was working at a university as a front end developer, and I wanted to share what I was working on with the computer science students at the university. I thought maybe we could collaborate on some projects and they could get something for, to put on their portfolios. And then I could maybe get some new insight because since I had never had a computer science education, I assumed there was a lot that I didn't know and that maybe they'd be able to fill in some of those gaps. So that was my intention at first. I don't think very many students actually watched, though. 
And uh, the only reason I ended up on Free Code Camp was because I didn't know what I was doing. So I posted a link to my live stream in the Free Code Camp forum asking for help uh, and advice. And Bo Carnes, who runs the Free Code Camp YouTube channel, happened to see that link and he watched one of my live streams and then invited me to live stream for Free Code Camp's channel, which was amazing to me because Free Code Camp was one of the ways that, that I learned how to code. And at the time, the channel had at least 50,000 subscribers. Wow. So it wasn't nearly as big as it is now. This was about three years ago. I only had a few subscribers. Like, literally, I... I maybe had less than 10 subscribers <laughs> at the time. So it was a, an amazing opportunity. Uh, it's kind of crazy that I actually did it. And when I look back on it now, I'm like, what was I thinking? Like, I, I should have been terrified. Uh, <laughs> but for, for some reason, I, I did it. And um, so that's how it all, it all started. And then at that point, it shifted. The focus really shifted to this external audience of a lot of people who are brand new to coding and trying to learn and some people who are more advanced but trying to pick up some of this particular coding stuff that I was working on. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, and my goal then became I just want to show what it's like for me working uh, at a normal programming job, mistakes included, and not rehearsing anything. I figured that would be valuable to some people. Yeah, definitely. I, I knew when I was coming up working solo most of the time, I always doubted whether or not I was a real programmer, you know. I got stuff done, but I didn't know if it was the right way. So I thought if there were other people like that out there, maybe they would benefit from seeing somebody who's like, who's getting paid to do this full time and, you know, see how much I mess up. And maybe they would uh, take some, some hope from that to say, it's, it's okay if you don't know everything. Yeah. And that's one of the things I've really liked about your live streams is that you're kind of open and vulnerable. So even though I was already working as a coder, I always felt like you said, like I was the only one or I made a lot of mistakes or doubted myself that I was a real coder and then I would watch you and it, it just felt like a great experience. So it's interesting that you say you started live streaming to learn CS and then you kind of kept live streaming to teach other people coding skills. Yeah. Um, Is that right? Yeah. I was surprised. So it wasn't just me teaching others. I was learning as well. I ended up learning way more than I expected. My projects that I was working on were all open source. So I ended up getting a lot of pull requests for the projects. And before I could merge them, I had to figure out what they were doing. So it forced me to learn a lot of new stuff very rapidly <laughs> and uh, probably way more quickly than I ever would on my own. And you know, some of the projects had uh, about a dozen different people all working on it, submitting pull requests at the same time. It became like a great vehicle for me to learn all these new things at the same time as I was, uh, you know, kind of helping other people learn as well. It definitely helped me level up. I watched one of your conference talks where you said that you use live streaming as a form of mentorship. So is that what you're talking about? Yeah, it ended up being uh, kind of like a mentorship thing. So, you know, we did have people of all skill levels and experience levels. So for some people, they were giving me a lot of advice. In, in solving a lot of the coding problems that I was dealing with. But for other people who were starting out, you know, they were really seeking guidance and advice. It was really cool to, to see people come through and they would start out and they would just be learning how to code, maybe trying to transition out of a different career. Uh, and then as they gained more, more skills and more confidence, eventually they would talk about how they were applying for jobs or got an interview. And um, it was always really exciting when they would come back and say, hey, I, I got a job. And uh, then it was bittersweet because when they would get a job, they wouldn't have time to watch the live stream as much. Uh, <laughs> but occasionally they would pop back in or I would stay in touch with them over Twitter or something. And, and uh, they would let me know how things were going and still like ask me for advice with how to handle things that were happening at their new companies. So it did kind of, without me really like intending to or trying, it these mentoring type of relationships just kind of happened. That ended up being really cool. And it wasn't just coding. Uh, we also talked about, you know, mental health issues and, mm. and different things like that. I mean, I have four kids, so that would come up about, you know, uh, family issues or even, you know, fitness. Just sometimes at the end of every live stream, I like to do a question and answer session. And so a lot of different topics would come up. And so we ended up the mentorship and kind of, uh, 
helping each other out just kind of expanded well beyond coding. And you've been doing this for about three years now, right? Yeah. So I actually, I I just looked up the dates that I started and my very first live coding video was on uh, April 18th, 2017. Wow. So it's, it's almost exactly three years. That's really amazing that you've made it this far. Are you doing anything special for your third anniversary? Yeah, I thought maybe I should. So I don't have anything planned yet, but I think it, it might be cool to uh, to do something to celebrate three years. Yeah, like a special live stream or something. Yeah, that would be fun. That'd be awesome. So this is something I'm interested in because I know you've popped into my live streams before. And of course, I don't have nearly as many people watching them yet. I'm kind of getting the hang of it still. Um, But I feel like I have a lot of ups and downs. Like I have some live streams where it just goes awesome. There's lots of people in the chat and it feels great. And then there's other live streams where there isn't as much or as many people. And it feels like I'm talking to myself for an hour and it gets really frustrating and I get in my own head. And it's just a totally different paradigm and skill to be able to I guess, rubber duck your entire coding session. So it can be really difficult. So do you feel like you've had some ups and downs in your live streams? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I've, I've had that experience where there's been, uh, you know, very few people or <laughs> sometimes nobody in the stream. Uh, and that, that is kind of difficult to force yourself to keep talking when you know nobody's listening. Uh, I just kind of kept reminding myself like, well, it's going to be recorded, like people can watch it later on. So I have to keep talking. (laughs) But then, you know, on the other side of things, once you get a lot of people in the chat, that becomes difficult as well. Uh, I ran into a problem where uh, like when I first started, I didn't have that many people watching. So I would just kind of keep an eye on the chat and keep checking it. Uh, But then once I got a lot of people, and I'm talking like 100 plus people at a time watching a stream, it started to get to be too much and I wasn't actually getting any coding done. It was always just looking at the chat. Mm-hmm. So I had to implement a, uh, a system where I would set a Pomodoro timer and I would code for 25 minutes and then I would take a five minute break and look at the chat and um, kind of force myself to code and not look at the chat and then take a break and just look at the chat. So I, I think there's Right around 100 uh, people in the chat seems to be like the sweet spot that is very doable. Mm -hmm. When I start to get more than that, um, I think I've had close to 300 at a time before, like as a like a peak number of viewers. And that's just crazy. And uh, at that point, there's too many messages in the chat. So they end up you lose them after a while, like it'll just cut off the chat. So you you miss out on what people say. You can't see what they said at that point. Um, so it's, it's pretty much impossible to catch up on the chat. So, so do you ever have a moderator that helps? So I've thought about getting a moderator. I never officially had any kind of moderator, but kind of unofficially, people that watch regularly will usually kind of give everybody the rundown of how things are going. Like at the beginning of the stream, I'll very quickly explain, this is what I'm doing. These are kind of like the, the rules that we go by. And then later on when people join... If they have questions that I've already answered, the people in the chat will usually help out and and answer them. So I haven't had to set up a moderator yet, but I think that's probably something like if the live streams grow and get even bigger, I definitely will need uh, a moderator at some point. It seems like they will because the Free Code Camp channel has over a million subscribers now. It's like 1.5 million, isn't it? Yeah, it's... (laughs) Yeah, it's grown. It's it's insane. Well, I guess when I started, I believe it was somewhere between 50 and 100,000. Wow. I could probably check the analytics for sure, but I think it was something like that. So the, the growth over the last three years has, has been amazing. And there's been a lot. We have a, t- a lot of different contributors to the channel. I don't want anybody to think that this is like mostly my videos because it's not. It's realistically, the my live streams only have like it has a decent audience, but they're not like the top most watched videos on the channel. I don't want to take undue credit there for the success of the channel. <laughs> yeah, they have all kinds of content, every kind of coding topic. I saw like a 10 hour AWS video come out. They have a lot of amazing stuff. Yeah, they do. They're really great. Like, And you're right. It's like every topic you can think of. I, I recently watched like a four hour tutorial on C sharp. Wow. I watched it on double speed. <laughs> and um, 
I do uh, that too. Yeah, it's you know what I definitely recommend if anybody ever watches one of my live streams or recording of it, watch me at double speed because I solve problems twice as fast <laughs> and I sound so much more intelligent. And so I recommend that. I like that. So would you recommend that other developers start live streaming? Yeah, definitely. I think it's it's a great way to at the very least, even if you don't get a, a large audience, it'll help you to level up your skills because you'll have to think through and articulate what you're doing, which which really helps. I didn't realize what a big help it was until I started doing it, but sometimes just explaining out loud what you're trying to do gets you through a problem so much faster than if you just try to think through it in your mind. Having a record of what you've done before is great. I have gone back and uh, I've, I've actually tried to do something, not been able to do it, gone and searched for the answer and found that I already did it in one of my previous videos and then watched myself do it before. So um, it, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy that That's funny. I, I've got to that point where I, I can't even remember that I actually attempted to do a thing before. You're such a prolific creator <laughs> that you just, you've already answered all your questions. Either that or I just have a really bad memory. I don't know. <laughs> um, but it's, it's great to have a record to go back and say, oh, you know what, I know I did that before. And to go back and see, here's how I did it. Or when you have to go back to a previous project and you're thinking, what was I thinking? Well, you, you can know exactly what you're thinking because you re recorded it. It's, it's like kind of almost like the best kind of documentation to actually know what the person who wrote it was thinking when they wrote it. Yeah. And it's not just great for you, it's great for potential employers. I've found that um, it's helped me a lot in my career because I've, I've been on both sides of the interview table and interviewing people and being interviewed. And I've found that it's really, it's hard to get to know someone's personality and whether they would really fit in in their thought process. So something like live coding gives a potential employer a view to what you're like, like what you're really like when you're, when you're actually coding and how you interact with other people. Almost every interview I've ever been on since I started live coding, the interviewer has brought up my live coding and wanted to know more about it. Awesome. And uh, I think it, the biggest fear when you're going to hire somebody is the unknown. It's like, I just don't know that much about this person. It's hard to get to know somebody just from talking to them for an hour or so. Uh, so you take away that fear from the, uh, the potential employer and they can feel much more comfortable in you know, giving you a position or they could say like, wow, I can't stand this person. Uh, in which case, then it's probably good for you because maybe you wouldn't have wanted to work there anyway. <laughs> it would have been a clash, but either way, it's... It's almost like they get to know you through the live stream and how you interact with people in the chat and they get to see your coding style too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's really, I think it's pretty unique. I don't, I don't know, other than maybe like an internship, I don't really know of a better way for a company to really get to know you that well before you know making that leap to to actually hire you yeah wow that sounds awesome it's a really interesting idea i know how hard it can be especially as a new developer to find a job and to get your foot in the door at that company so i want to ask you for live streaming should beginners be live streaming do you have to be a little bit more advanced so you kind of know your way around the code a little bit more when do you think is the best time for people to start you could definitely start as a beginner. I could see somebody maybe who's doing some sort of uh, free coding curriculum, like Free Code Camp, starting off and saying, I'm going to live stream me going through this curriculum. And that could be uh, potentially like beneficial to other people going through the curriculum. And it would almost be like uh, you could have your own little cohort going through that coding curriculum that would, you know, you would watch each other, you know, coding and, and discuss the problems and things. So it, it could definitely be beneficial for a newer mm, person. Yeah, okay. Or someone more experienced. Uh, it would just be a totally different vibe in, in the stream. If you were newer, you'd be much more likely to find kind of like unofficial mentors who would watch you and maybe give you advice when, when needed. If you're more experienced, you're probably going to get you know, newer people who want to learn what, what you know. So it's, it's going to be a different dynamic, but I think both could be valuable for the viewers and for the person live streaming. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I want to move on from live streaming because I know you create a lot of other types of content from writing to other kinds of videos to your speaking engagements. And I just want to ask you if you're working on anything new or interesting right now that you would like to share. Yeah, so um, a few things. So some of my projects, I, I live stream occasionally. I'll drop in to do a live stream on. So working on a, um, a React Native app that's like a children's game, children's math game. Uh, and mostly started doing that for my kids to learn math. But I'm also, I started working with a brain computer interface. Oh, yeah. And that's probably the coolest thing that, I'm, that I've been working on. Uh, I did do, I did a video and I did a live stream with it. But there's a, there's a company called uh, Neurosity that came out with a brain computer interface they're calling Notion. And I actually had, I, I met one of the founders of the company at a conference a few years ago. And at the time he was with Netflix. And uh, we spoke at a uh, the speaker's dinner. We just like happened to be sitting next to each other. And it kind of all started there where I just talked about my oldest son has uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And I talked about wanting to use some sort of brain computer interface to help him with that and maybe create an app that would help him to be able to kind of calm himself down and recognize before it got too bad when his brain was starting to get into this obsessive compulsive kind of mode. And uh, we talked for a while about that. And then he ended up leaving Netflix shortly after that and starting his own brain computer interface company. We kept in touch. And then I was one of the, the first on the list to get the, the new device. Okay. So uh, I'm working on that. And it's pretty cool. It's, um, it's wild to be able to get data into your app that's streaming directly from your brain. <laughs> yeah, I bet. You know, part of me thinks that's really exciting, everything you're talking about. And the other part of me thinks it's a little bit dystopian to have an API that can access your brainwaves. So I'm wondering if you could train it for everyday activities. Like, let's say you're watching a movie and you think about pause and then it can pause the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can it work like that? Yeah, exactly. So the uh, the way that they have it set up, uh, it can very easily detect things in your uh, your motor cortex. So if you are thinking about something, I think it's easy to detect when you think about motions. Oh, that's interesting. So physical motions. So you would maybe have a, a certain movement of your hands or a part of your body or something like that, because uh, evidently, your brain looks exactly the same if you're actually moving your arm or if you're just thinking about moving your arm. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, it's the same signals. So um, you can train it to detect what your particular brain looks like when you're thinking about, let's say, moving your right arm. And so then it looks for that. And whenever it detects that same pattern, it can trigger any any event you want, especially with, uh, with Internet of Things devices. It's really kind of limitless as to what you can what you can program it to do so i'm, I'm very excited I'd, I'd like to set it up yeah i'd like to make a connector between the brain computer interface and some of the um i don't know what you call them but uh things like zapier or if this then that so that it would allow users to be able to connect and set up a lot of different actions without actually having to write the code and because right now you know, it's such a new product, like you really need to be able to write code to get it to do what you want. So I think, you know, writing that connector to make it kind of easier to do things without code would be a, a big step and, uh, you know, more people being able to use it. That is really interesting. I'm just envisioning right now this workshop of people working on the, the brain interface and everyone's just thinking and all these IoT devices are going off as people are thinking. Yeah, there's, it could be very cool. Uh, I've, I've been trying to think of really practical things, but there's also like really fun things uh, that you could do. M one of the more practical things that I'd like to do is uh, use it, make a, an Android Auto app that would, um, it would alert you whenever you're losing focus when you're driving. So one of the things it can detect is your level of focus mm -hmm. and you could set it to a certain threshold to see if you're below this level of focus, maybe make a little noise or do something. 
you know, I thought that would be helpful. I mean, we're, we're not quite at the, at the time yet whenever everybody will have self, self-driving cars. So maybe until then, this would be something to maybe help prevent accidents since I think most accidents are some type of user error at this point, I think. Yeah, and not just accidents. There's a lot of people who have maybe a mental illness or some kind of problem with focus. So I could see that, you know, helping people who have focus issues at some point. That's interesting. Yeah, I um I I'd like it the my the first step in my developing that is just to get a similar system working as an an app for your phone so that you could just hit a button to start the focus monitoring and have it, you know, vibrate your phone or something so that no matter what you're doing, it would still track your focus. So it's like an anchor kind of. Yeah. Mhm. I think it could definitely be useful. I I'm, I'm just interested to see like what other types of things that it could be paired with. The idea behind that, I actually zoned out when I was driving. Uh, I was, me and, and my four children were driving to my parents' house, and I completely missed the exit uh, off the highway to get to their house. And I kept driving for a few more minutes after that, and the kids started saying, I, I just, I looked around, and I said, where am I? And the kids all started saying, I didn't know where we were going. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, I had, that's my usual route to get to work. So I had just kind of zoned out and got into like commute mode oh, yeah. and totally passed it up. And I thought, you know, what, what was I thinking? It kind of scared me a little bit because I'm like, how, like, how long have I just been zoned out? Yeah, well, what did I miss? Uh, that happened right when I had kind of first got the brain computer interface. So that kind of gave me the idea for the being, being alert. So it's not like the, the coolest or most fun idea, uh, but it'd be useful. It'd be something I would probably use <laughs> myself yeah it definitely sounds useful i know you also mentioned in some of your talks that you get social anxiety so i wanted to ask you because you go to all these conferences public speaking live streaming and everything else that you do you know how do you deal with it and manage it through all that yeah so um i will say in terms of the public speaking once i get started i feel fine it's always like the time right before that I, I feel the most nervous, which at that point, like you, you really can't back out, like you're already there. And so it's, uh, I'm fine once I get started. And uh, the social anxiety is, is kind of odd. At conferences, it's, it's honestly not that terrible. I mean, t- there are times at conferences where I just have to say like, all right, I got to go back to my hotel and just take a nap, right? It's just, it's too much. But it almost comes in waves. Like there are times when I'm okay. And then there, there are definitely down times where I don't even want to leave my house if my neighbors are outside in the yard, right? Yeah. Like, it's just this weird thing where I don't know how to explain it. I don't know. Like, I don't understand it. But it's just there's a part of me that just does not want to leave my house. I don't want to see anybody. Uh, usually like that, that goes along with some depression. Lately, I've been doing pretty well with that. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, I've got on a... Um, pretty good schedule with counseling and medication and uh, and things like that. I found out recently that I have sleep apnea. So I think sleep deprivation was making it a lot worse. And uh, so I, I recently, uh, I think it was a book that you recommended. You have a list of books you recommend. And there was one about sleeping on the list, I think. Is that correct? Oh, right. Uh, it was called How We Sleep or something. Like how that. How yeah. We Sleep. Yeah. So it was when you came out with that list, I looked at it, and then uh, I, I saw that some of the books, and I added them to my um, my library app, and there was like a really long wait to get the book, but I finally got it a couple of weeks ago and listened to the audiobook. I kind of realized how much, how many of my anxiety and depression symptoms could potentially have been made worse by my sleep apnea, my lack of sleep. I think that's been helping a lot. That's gotten better been on a pretty good exercise routine, which I guess helps. But part of the the problem with that is when I travel for conferences, I get off my routine. Yeah. So usually what happens is I'm okay when I'm at the conference, but then when I come back, that's whenever it hits me, all the travel and everything. So like the week after a conference, I'm usually like don't want to go anywhere. Yeah, it's been and I've I've, I have done a video about that. It's been a while since I've talked about it, but I did do a video about that, which I got some really uh, great response from. One person watched it and said, like, I never knew what was wrong with me, but I feel like this, like you do. And now I know, you know, it's really like anxiety and depression. I ended up being really glad that I did the video. Yeah. (laughs) 
because I guess it's something that people are talking about it way more than they used to, which is awesome, but it's still not something that you people talk about enough. Uh, so I think it was really cool that it seemed to be kind of helpful uh, to some people. Yeah, especially with research showing that it's even more prevalent in the tech community than in the regular population. So it's nice that mm. it's nice that people are finally talking about it. You know, there's one, I guess he's an activist for mental health in the tech community. He runs OSMI, Ed Finkler, and he always gives the analogy that when someone wears glasses, technically they're impaired, right? But you never tell someone to squint harder or, you know, that, oh, something's wrong with you, like you can't do this. No, you just treat them like they're normal people. It's <laughs> the same with mental health. Take it seriously, but treat them like they're normal people if that makes sense. I think that's an interesting analogy. That's a great analogy. Yeah, I like that. And it's great for people who have some mental health issues should remember that. And then people who don't should also remember it. I, I've talked with people who have mental health issues who won't seek help through counseling or medication and just keep trying to think of it as some sort of like willpower issue, right? And I, I think realizing, you know, saying like, hey, if, if you had a physical illness, Right. Or let's say if you needed glasses, you would get glasses. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with that. And, and most often, I mean, I'm, I'm not a doctor at all, but from what I understand, a lot of this is it's an issue with the chemistry in your brain. So at the root of it, it is really a physical problem. You know, and the best tools that we have right now medically to deal with that are you know, medication and, and counseling. Not everybody is going to need the same type of treatment. You know, our brain's vary from per one person to another on you know what they need but that's the that's the best treatment that's out there so why not why not do that it's not like there's anything wrong with you just like you know person who's uh who needs glasses isn't less of a person yeah and from somebody who i've been through the cycle of denying the problem going years without w refusing medication and counseling and then getting on medication, doing counseling, and then thinking I was cured and I don't need it anymore so much uh, that I, I think I, I have at least a little bit of experience to, to tell people like, hey, it's, it's totally, it's something that's okay. And yeah. you will definitely not regret reaching out to a counselor or a doctor or something uh, to get help. Yeah, that's awesome. We definitely need to make it less taboo. So thank you for talking about it. I thought that was great. Oh, you're welcome. So I kind of went on a little bit about that, but it's just, I, I feel pretty passionate about that. Yeah. And that's why you're on here to talk about your experience and share. So where do you recommend people who are just getting started in development? Where do you recommend they get started? Well, of course I recommend Free Code Camp. <laughs> uh, and I, I think um, that's where I started out at. Uh, they have a great curriculum and it is entirely free. And then they have a ton of supplemental resources as well on their YouTube channel, the forum. They have blogs. They have a podcast. They have wiki style like a page of guide of, that has so much information. There's a seemingly endless amount of, of content just from Free Code Camp. If for some reason you really don't like Free Code Camp, uh, a few other resources that, that I recommend that I had used in the past are in browser tutorials, I think are great starting out because it can be overwhelming to get a developer set up running on your, your local machine. Definitely. It, so it's, it's not necessary to do that. So maybe check out Code Academy. Uh, they have an in-browser tutorial. And at least when I did it, they had a lot of free lessons. So I think it's still like that. And uh, Udacity also has some free courses that were very helpful. If you need more structure, definitely check out some paid courses. So I have done Udacity's React Nano degree, which I found to be very helpful. And that was a paid course. And my wife is also a developer and she went through a boot camp. She really liked the structure of the boot camp and having a lot of other people in her cohort to, uh, to collaborate with and talk with. If, if that is your style, then, you know, definitely check that out. From what I understand, the uh, quality of the boot camp varies greatly. So don't just pick the first one you find, like do some research uh, and try to find a good one. But there are good ones out there. And so talk to people yeah. uh, who have maybe gone through the boot camp to get a good idea of, of which, which one's right for you. That's where, yeah, that's where I would start. Just start building things. Like as soon as you learn the basics, try to use it and do a little bit every day. 
and also like you you will get to a point where things seem very very confusing that's completely normal and it will happen over and over again but it doesn't mean you can't do it it's it just means like you're you're about to level up push push through those times like everybody goes through it don't get too discouraged you might be stuck on some problem and it's just taking you forever to get through <laughs> it's okay to skip over a lesson if it's taking you a long time or to look for a hint or something like that it it, it isn't like when you're in school when you know you have to do everything and everything is for a test and you do it sequentially right this is your your own thing you're learning practical skills to use so you know feel free to ask for help from other people and do what you you know do what you need to do to learn it and don't feel like you need to learn it all yeah as long as you know where to find the answer that's good because we all look things up all the time on the job yes we definitely do so just having some general idea of where to go to find the answer is is good enough wow so we've talked about a lot in this episode already from mental health to live streaming different types of coding do you have anything else you wanted to bring up before we wrap it up I guess uh, if if anybody uh, is is listening to this and happens to watch uh, any of my my videos or my live streams uh, and you have any advice for me, please let me know because I'm always trying to get better and do things that that might be helpful to other people. So if if you have any ideas for content or if you just realize that I I do something very annoying and you don't like it, you can let me know as well. <laughs> All right. So I always like to recommend a couple resources at the end. Jesse already recommended some great coding resources as well as the book, Why We Sleep, which I'm gonna link in the show notes. I've also been binging on Isaac Asimov books. He's a prolific sci-fi author, if you haven't heard of him. He wrote so many amazing books. And if you wanna get started with his books, he has a standalone book called The End of Eternity, which is about time travel and the future and space and so many other things. It's really the most amazing sci-fi book I've ever read. So I'm gonna link that in the show notes as well. So Jesse, before you leave, can you tell everyone where they can find you online? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm on YouTube on the Free Code Camp channel. I have my own YouTube channel as well. And uh, it's Jesse Weigel, I think is the, the channel. Uh, but I'm on Twitter as Jesse R. Weigel, J-E-S-S-E-R-W-E-I-G-E-L. I'm also somewhat active on Instagram, and that's jesse.weigel. I'm on all the other social things, but I'm not really that active. But if, if you You're happen everywhere. to be, I'm everywhere. So whatever your favorite place to be is, you can follow me or reach out to me on there. <laughs> uh, and um, I'm, I'm pretty good about getting back to everybody if, if you message me. You know, don't don't be afraid uh, if you have questions to reach out. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for all the info and for coming on the show today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the first episode of Faraday Tech Cafe. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a positive review on your podcasting platform of choice. For questions or feedback related to the show, you can email us at contact at faradayacademy.com. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel called Faraday Academy for more technical content. Join us next Monday for another interview about how making relationships with technical recruiters can help you navigate your software engineering career. Until next time. <music>